Thank you very much. I'm, you know, I'm very honored and I'm actually, I mean, excited to, to be here for many reasons and in part because I have sentimental attachment to Sweden because Sweden was the first, the first um, international visit of mine, you know, at the end of the Soviet Union. You know, in the summer of 1990, I went for a summer school in Uppsala, so Stockholm. Um, and only after that, I went to the United States and other places in the world um, to work. So I, I like to come back to Sweden from time to time, you know. Um, and that's, it's very nice, you know, to, to be able to present um, an overview of what we do with, with school segregation and school choice in, in, in Russia. Um, here's the outline of, of, of the, the presentation. I'll first will speak in general about Russian school system and the emergence of school choice, because you, you would have to know uh, the Russian politics of, of education. Then I'll talk about our data on school differentiation in urban areas and how they work. Then our data on how parents choose the schools, what are the determinants of, of their behavior. And then I'll talk at the end of how I make sense of our data through the you know, signaling theory, and, and then the end will be the further steps we want to do, and um, uh, what, what is the next step in our research. In this case, an introduction to Russian school system. It, it is 11 years of compulsory education. Uh, at the age of 15, after the ninth grade, you have to continue for two years more, and, but you can choose for vocational track, technical college, or stay in, in the same school you were in. And uh, the, um, the trick with the Russian system is that we don't have, I mean, formally we do have division between primary school, secondary school, and high school, right? But in fact, most of the children, about 90% in urban areas, stay in the same school from the first year, you know, at least to the ninth grade. And then some of them move to the vocational track. But and often uh, parents think of that they can move their child between schools, but then they get trapped, you know, by sort of social capital because you know you don't want to break you know friendship networks, you know, and then you establish the rapport with with teachers and school principal. You don't want to move, right? So um, the crucial you know school choice is around the age six, seven. So. Parents are often choosing, you know, the environment for their child for 11 years, and um, um, a lot depends on it. And many parents understand it, so they, they think of it as a very strategic choice. I used to joke that uh, Russians are very low on, on long-term strategic choices. They, they are not voting, they're not doing this, they're not investing money. So the only thing they really care long-term is choosing school for 11 years of their child, and then the future to the university. So it's interesting to study school choice in Russia because they're the most strategic choice most of the parents are making. Um, and um, currently, there is quite a segmentation of schools. You know, in the St. Petersburg, it's about 59% of, of standard schools. And then others are specialized. The gymnasium are in um, uh, languages and the humanities. The Lyceum, it's called the, the schools for math and physics and you know, sometimes chemistry, but mostly math and informatics. And then would be other specialized types of, of schools, mostly languages, but also you know, art and, and sports and whatnot. And the number of schools, 60%, standard curriculum, basic curriculum, but in terms of enrollment, 65% are in specialized schools. Because schools, as you will see, are very different, they vary in size. Uh, in the successful schools, like gymnasium and some of some of them have over a thousand students. And some have about 200. And um, that's not good, as, as, as you'll see. Uh, how it emerged? First of all, in the Soviet Union, with the idea of social equality and that sort of Soviet ideology, the, the school system was quite equalized. The standard curriculum was imposed in every school. And there was not much of a 
segregation. We know from historical data that um, um, in the 40s and early 50s, the schools attended by children of the party authorities in Moscow and in St. Petersburg and Leningrad at that time were just the same schools which were accepting children from, from the same micro area, you know, catchment area, workers, children, yeah. And slowly, then there's emergence of specialized schools. And that's a nice story um, outside of the main topic of my presentation, but that was, was a collusion of university academic elites and party elites who wanted their children to study foreign languages. You know, and they sort of worked together to build, to build good schools. At the same time, the mathematicians who wanted to, have, to build schools specialized in math were arguing that it's important for national security. And um, I have great anecdotes from you know, oral interviews you know, with people who were organizing it, like um, they were discussing it with the party, communist party authorities and the city bosses. Um, and one of the bosses was saying, you talk about national security, don't bullshit me. It's really about you reproducing intelligentsia, you know? You just want to reproduce yourself, you know? But still, you know, so slowly it emerged. And you will see that, you know, I'll, at some point in the presentation, I will show that how this path dependency, you know, in, in, in schools' trajectories, you know, fair now, because the those specialized schools are most prestigious and the um, local worker schools are not. But still, you know, um, in Moscow, by statistics, we don't have good statistics for Petersburg, but for Moscow, there is reasonable statistics for the end of the Soviet Union. It's only 14% were that sort of specialized, and others were just standard schools. And what happened is that, uh, you know, with the idea of sort of new humanities and giving freedom to teachers and students to, to pursue their interests, at the end of the Soviet era, you know, teachers and politicians argued for freeing schools from the sort of standardized, you know, uh, system. In the, this discussion, like in the name of, 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 of freedom and democracy, you know, uh, launched the explosion of specialization of schools. So by 93, 94, standard curriculum schools were only 17. Others boasted something special. Languages, art programs, you know, mathematics, classical languages, just everything. And what happened is that they, they, they basically wanted to create, diversify uh, education and build human-oriented, you know, democratic education. What they actually built was, you know, red and tooth and claw, you know, educational market in which parents started to pay money uh, to teachers and school principals for additional courses. And in the 90s, it, with, with, with the Russian capitalism, it was just, just paying money. Uh, 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 and um, um, uh, uh, with, with the state trying to impose some order on it, they built differentiation you know, uh, for funding. Because um, parents from, from uh, gymnasiums and, and in sense were lobbying for more funds for their schools. So what happened is that in some regions, gymnasia were getting per capita funding two times more than, in, than, than the standard schools. So you know, the prestigious schools, which attracted middle class and upper middle class you know, students were going up in terms of funding and in terms of curriculum development. In the schools which get working class children were taking two times less funding and were going down. And teachers were not paid well in the 90s and in the early 20s. Um, then they introduced, you know, universal per capita funding. And currently, the, the current political situation is that this the system is imposed in big cities that every school should have the same amount of money per student. There would be no favors for gymnasiums or specialized schools. And of course, you can see 
parents up in arms, you know, talking in TV, you know, talking to newspapers. And since not much of, I mean, one of the interesting things in Russia is that there's not many political issues you can discuss. You know, many, many political issues are forbidden to discuss. But school choice is open for discussion. So the minister of education is the sort of, you know, the straw man for people, you know, to kill. You know, so parents who can have access to media, you know, they all the time talking about changing the Ministry of Education because he's responsible for everything bad which happens in the country. It's, it's because you cannot discuss the Minister of Defense, right, you know, in current political situation, or, or even the Minister of Finances, you know, just no go area, right? But you can discuss the Minister of Education. The other thing which worked is that in the early um, 2000s, you know, the universal state exam was introduced. And it, I mean, people in general, um, parents hate the universal state exam in Russia. They think it's ruined. And I believe it just one of the best things which happened to Russian educational system. Because before the introduction of state exam, the 90s, um, the, the, the interregional mobility and going to tertiary education virtually ceased to exist. Because every university was asking for for a student to go to university to pass a certain exam, which was local. So you want to go to Lin Shopping, you know, you go to Lin Shopping and pass written exams right here in this building, for example, right? If you want to go to Lund, you know, have to go to Lund and pass the exam there. Nothing, you know, no documents to mail. You know. So that's a huge investment. You go from Siberia to Moscow or St. Petersburg. It's a long way. You stay for a month, passing all these exams, and they, they fail you. You know, what's the, what's the point? So the universal state exams revitalized interregional mobility. And uh, so children who are good in math and pass you know, the state exam with flying colors in a small town somewhere in Siberia, they think, OK, I can go to Moscow to, Physica Tech, to, to Institute of Technology or you know, high school of economics. And, um, it really works. We have all the data, all the statistics for that. But the other side of it is that now schools are measured by their performance on universal state exams. And parents are looking for the data on the internet, you know, which, which school is performing better. And um, so they, send their, they want to send their children, uh, not all of them, but some, but choosing on the basis of this state exam. Uh, so that's the, that's the background of what's, what's going on. And uh, um, I have to say that, that parents from upper middle class and you know, professional middle class has a lot of, have a lot of power in terms of um, talking educational policies and you know, forcing schools to accept their, you know, they, they use all means available. They, they lobby. They, they, they go to newspapers, they complain. Um, so uh, with this new, new attempt to, to equalize schools more, um, the school's principal were saying, oh, look, you know, the parents will get their way anyway. You know, through some, you know, because there was several attempts to introduce catchment area. So, you know, this school should be for this area, and this school should be this area. You know, get them localized. Doesn't work. Somehow, all the attempts of the city government to do this were ruined by, by parents' lobbying. And um, I have a disagreement on that with, with some of my friends in political science who all the time talk about, you know, sort of like educational reforms under Putin. And I'm laughing, saying, and Putin has nothing to do with it. Putin is concerned with many other things, oil, you know, military, but not with schools, you know. And so it's, it's just parents. It's just, you know, massive action of many people choosing schools and lobbying for, for you know, benefits to these schools rather than just organized state policy. Uh, so what do we get for school differentiation? First, a few words about our data. Uh, for a while, we were just data gathering. Because I have to say, there's no good government or educational data in the country. The last uh, census uh, was totally disastrous. 
I think it was all, you know, sort of fake. Um, uh, the CT, oh, very, very bad data. I mean, they, they have data on how many children there are in school, you know, because the per capita funding. But which children, you know, they're, you know, you know, ethnicity background, socioeconomic, nobody measures socioeconomic background. Um, and now it's, it's a bit changing. We started with, with several surveys. Uh, so it's not, we, did, we didn't do it in once. We, we had several surveys in St. Petersburg. Uh, the major survey we did one year was with, with student networks, and we listed complete networks for every class. Oh, I have to say one thing I forget there, that students, oh, when they come in, they're assigned to a class, A, B, and C. And there's no electives. So they stay with the same, with the same bunch of kids. They can stay for this 11th year. So class is the main, you know, uh, uh, main important thing. And, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I mentioned to you, I'm talking to, to Pierre uh, earlier, that uh, when we look for friends, then we have, you know, multi-level structure in, in our research that, you know, uh, individual, um, uh, friends, class, school. School effects completely disappear. So the, because the friend selection and then influence, you know, um, has the most power over children. Then we, we did the Moscow suburban area, which is large for minorities, you know, living there. It's like banlieue. And then we did some work in rural areas and in small cities. And uh, uh, to compare big urban areas with, with small areas, and you know, it, uh, as I will mention, it's, it's important for you know, school choice and school differentiation. So that's how, I mean, um, um, here's the, if you have the aggregate school, you know, actually it's ISA. You know, we, we have ISCO coding, um, uh, with exception of, you know, often, often they, they don't know well um, father's, you know, um, occupation. So there, there are some missing on father's side, but better on mother's side. So, um, but whatever we, we measure, then, you know, we get, you know, socioeconomic index. And, you know, the, the school size is positively associated with, with socioeconomic status of, of parents. And the minority is inversely and associated that um, the uh, the higher aggregated school is, yes, there will be less minority. And there are two exceptional schools with high percentage of minority children, uh, which uh, one is um, Armenian, what's called Armenian school, now there is Azerbaijani school, but uh, local educational offices and district offices are sending all children to these schools. So you go to Armenian school and they have, you know, um, 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 uh, they have very good relations with their Armenian church, but you get about 5% you know, of Muslim children in, in this Christian Armenian school because local educational office is sending, you know, uh, children from North Caucasus, from Central Asia to, 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 to the school, you know, which is maybe even more. I think it's about 10% there of, of out of 50 would be, you know, Muslim children. And then, then, then you get this this amount of minority children, and most gymnasiums are, you know, their minorities are absent. But you know, of course, it doesn't show here. But uh, there is quite a social class segregation within the diasporas. So poor, um, recently arriving immigrants are attending these schools in well integrated rich Armenians, Azerbaijani, North Caucasians, you know, uh, Tajiks, educated, are attending gymnasiums and, and lyceums. And uh, I mean, we did some ethnographic work with them, and there is quite a class cleavage in, 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 in diasporas, that um, uh, some of them were thinking of you know, some of the integrated and rich entrepreneurs um, from Armenian as a region because they're thinking that these newly arrived immigrants from our countries are giving us that name. You know, that sort of, you know. So there's quite a cleavage. Well, anyway, 
um, so in um, uh, the sorting, you know, so you have, you know, school socioeconomic status and the aggregate ecological level, then you have universal state exams in the result, much higher. In the universal relations with students living for vocational track, some of them do leave even from, you know, some of the gymnasiums and because probably they can't fare there, but, but mostly, no. They're poor schools with small number of children, underfunded because of the per capita funding. And uh, we don't have, unfortunately, longitudinal data, but it's, it seems to be clear that, you know, these schools are, you know, uh, with a um, large number of, 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 of children, uh, they have more money, they're going up, they're hiring better teachers and, and attracting better students, and these schools are going down. One of the one of the side effects of it, which uh, I won't go into, you know, detail, is that um, since the, these schools are in poor neighborhoods and they are in dire need of more students to get more per capita funding, they're very happy to have migrant children in there. And so teachers are in are are good to to, to minority children for various reasons. And it, you know, through what we have in, in our data is that children are well integrated. We even did, we even did for Red, Red Cross and UNICEF, we did sort of applied work on um, doing focus groups with, with uh, minority children and, and especially with groups of, who don't have citizen states. Because some of the Armenians and Azerbaijani whose parents arrived there in the early 90s already are citizens. And, uh, and they talk about themselves as, as, um, as citizens of Russia, you know, when, when you interview them. Um, but um, uh, uh, so they're pretty well integrated. And in these focus groups, there were, when we asked them about uh, discrimination or, you know, and a xenophobic, you know, signs there, and they were saying about uh, having it on public transportation from old people. But never through all the focus groups we did, and they ever mentioned of any, any xenophobia in the school. So they, they are aware it exists in the Russian society, but not in schools. Schools, to me, you know, seems to be pretty good. So what's the, the, then, you know, you know, that's, you know, the relation between, you know, social economic status and the chances of going to gymnasium, right? That's all the ratios, you know. And that the same picture with the you know, the use of cultural home resources, you know, measured by books at home. So when controlled for socioeconomic status, books at home still add something, you know, to the probability, right, of of children from these families going, you know, looking to to gymnasium or you know math math school. One of the things is that. We're looking for, and we're trying to look at local sorting systems. So we we trying to to see how uh, education system are locally bound. Um, uh, or I I I I won't, you know. Uh, but more important is that uh, in urban areas, in most of the cases, where we're able to find differentiation between schools, there's virtually no tracking. Um, in uh, uh, within the school, there were only two cases uh, of in-school tracking. You know, we came into one school and we realized that all the Georgian kids from Georgia in this class, and all the Russian kids are in this class. One, and that was the, the the only case we were able to find. And was why? And so because there were two schools which were merged. One was was predominantly Georgian, but a small one. And another predominantly Russian. But the small one, they merged, they put together, but they didn't want to disrupt classes. In another uh, case of in-school tracking by socioeconomic class, I mean, really, you know, desperate, uh, was in, on the outskirts in which it was evidently looked like a small town. And in the rural small town, there's always every school we worked in had in-school differentiation. Because parents of a higher socioeconomic status somehow you know, managed to 
put their children aside you know, with, with the peers of the same status. And schools are very willing to do that. Um, because, I mean, they like it. They, you know, they have theories about you know, the importance of tracking, the ability tracking. But of course, it's not ability tracking. It, it's, it's social class tracking. Uh, and, um, uh, but local sorting systems, I, I thought that I would rather show you know, the pictures that uh, brown, brown are the living areas and the gray are industrial areas, which are now, they try to turn into the, the new developments. But still, you can see that the city is divided. You know, you know there's old city here, and there's new areas which are divided in sort of natural uh, local sorting systems. And the industrial zones and rivers form sort of, you know, quote unquote, natural boundaries for them. And uh, what happens is that uh, in the city, there are few very top notch schools in terms of you know, math performance, for example. And they're very selective. And they take students at the age 14, 15 based on the results of math performance. And uh, in Russia, we have this, what they call the math Olympics. So they have. To in the math competitions for the, for the city. In these few schools, which are in here, here, and here, they go around and scout for talent on the local you know, math competitions. Then they say, you know, why don't you come to us and study? At the age when they can travel. So kids travel to these central schools from everywhere. And the same you know, works for one classical gymnasium with Greek and Latin, which takes students from all over the city. And the same works for Azerbaijani and Armenian, quote unquote, school. Because some Azerbaijani kids come from afar to attend the school here. But it's not that, it's not top in terms of the, the, the test scores. But other, you know, in most of the areas, you have uh, local own, you know, top schools. Like, you know, kids which are good at math, often, you know, though their parents don't want them to travel too far. So slowly, in every area, uh, emerged one school which is very good at math, which is selective, and uh, and it usually takes some new children. You know, so some go for the first grade, but then they their intake, additional intake through the classes, because of the the math Olympics. There is only one area, for example, here which don't have, in here's the river, but that's really the poorest working class neighborhood of. Of, 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 of Petersburg. Accidentally, uh, sociology recently, you know, um, our department of sociology moved to this area here uh, before we moved, you know, back to the city center after reconstruction of the building. So we are now trying to do surveys and work with local schools here because that's sort of, yeah. We thought that it's even appropriate that sociologists move to the poorest neighborhood. Um, of the city. Um, uh, and um, uh, here, um, uh, in most of the areas, we don't have a large scale housing segregation. What works, I have you know, pictures. You know, that's um, that's the um, one of the islands, which is like Vasilivsky Island here. That's like, I don't know, Södermalm or something. Um, uh, you know, what happens is that um, you have a block with inside courtyard, and the part which faces street uh, with with trees is sort of gentrified. It's well painted. Um, um, our apartments are repaired, and usually now by now owned by 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 well-to-do people. But when you move through inside, you know, then you get you know. Shabby, shabby looking courtyard, you know, graffiti, and uh, very, very mixed um, inhabitants. Uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, I, I have this idea, which I'm, of course I cannot prove, that uh, people compensate the absence of, of housing segregation by school segregation. So the they say, okay, we live with these people. Basically, the well-to-do people say, we live with these people, but my children will go to a different school. 
Yeah, and that's the you know the case. You know, we have several cases. We we sort of map them you know through the city of schools which are adjacent, but this would have 25% minority children, and this would have virtually none, and this would small number. One is a primary school, and these are this is the English language schools with lots of you know modern languages and especially English, and this is the minority school, and this is the from interview of the school principal from this school. She says, we were always a school for migrants, but they were Limitchiki, which is like Russians from rural areas sent by the Soviet system to work in construction or in, in, in the big cities. And uh, you know, children of engineers always went to this school with English languages from the 60s. Um, and um, this pattern reemerges all the time in other areas of the city. Uh, uh, for example, we have some cases we study that in in the 19 early 1980s they built three schools in new area which were supposed to have standard curriculum. Right? By now, one is gymnasium, another is you know uh, poor poor working kids you know school, but they're close you know walking distance. Um, so. You know, uh, a few words on how, how parents and, and choose schools, because we did a small school survey, actually on this Vasilevsky Island, you know. Um, uh, you know, we, we talked to parents in, in, in primary school when they were usually mothers, you know, waiting for, for their children to appear at the end of the school day, the first, school, first, first year. And, uh, uh, at first, we, we, we thought that there will be, you know, mm, many people would refuse, you know, the interview. But no, no, they were happy to talk. So we, we asked, you know, how they get information, what was important, whether, you know. And actually, one of the important questions turned out to be whether they considered other schools. So, you know, we have to distinguish between choosers and non-choosers, as we call them, you know. So, who looked for other options and those who didn't. Many of them didn't, and um, so that's the the you know, essay composition of what we we surveyed. You know, that in gymnasium you have higher socioeconomic status, uh, and um, so uh, for um, for parents who are choosing advanced curriculum schools, you know, as opposed to standard schools, such as old ratios. Uh, um, you know, um, this is the, their education, right? So, um, uh, um, uh, in what's what's important for parents with higher education? Most important is academic achievement of the school. And um, with um, uh, with the parents who are choosing. Um, uh, standard schools, the ethnic composition is very important. And basically, you know, our idea is that, you know, when when people look for, I mean, it's interesting that how they sort of phrase it. Uh, they when when they talk to them, they talk about cultural background of the future peers. But in one case, they would mean the ability in math. For example, right, and you know how well they're read, and in another it would be the, the, the issue of minority, under under the same you know, the word culture. Actually, I mean quite different vision of what of what they're looked for. I mean, at the same time, it's possible, and we think that that's quite the case in many cases that um, uh, the you know I'll, I'll say a few words about it later that they are. Actually, it's not because they're opposed in general to minority children, but they see it as a sign, you know, of school um, uh, poorly performing and uh, uh, focusing on 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 minority children to improve their Russian language, so distracting um, uh, resources from working with with other children. In that that they they. they the, the, the decision tree 
um, for how it works with you know choosers versus non-choosers. So you know you ask them you know in you know if the cultural background is important, they're mostly you know really considering on different situations. Then then you go the next uh, fork is with mother's education. In most mothers with no edu higher education don't consider choosing. There are virtually none who would consider three or more schools, and only a few who would consider just another one close by. And um, then you go with higher education. The choosers are looking at the school academic achievement. So the available data on school academic achievement and um, uh, is very helpful to them. But how they, they measure cultural background of classmates, that's another you know, question because you know, there's no measure for it, right? There's no data. So they just go and look, right? So that brings me to the um, next part of, of what I was going to talk about, which is signs and signals in school choice of how parents read schools and how schools read parents and what they say to each other when, when this, this school choice is, is made is that, as I would call it, tacit two-sided matching because it's not open. Formally, all these schools are supposed to take most of the children, you know, if they have registration in, in this district and things like that. But their ways of dealing with it is the way, as, as, as in rural areas, there's a way of dealing, of tracking people. Because they come and say, I want to be in this class. And the school says, it's, it's not that easy, you know? And usually they, you know, well, um, uh, I'll, I'll say later what, what did they say, you know? So uh, when you talk to them, they all, you know, look for good schools and, 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 and good children. Right? So what does it mean? Not only you know, education is a credence good in which you don't actually know the quality of the good um, uh, beforehand, uh, but the quality is very elusive and fuzzy uh, concept which we have to disentangle by you know, uh, studying carefully you know, what people mean and what, what they do and how they optimize and, you know, the quality. And indeed, you know, for, for as we you know, we saw in the previous, like in decision trees, you know, with, with um, different socioeconomic groups of parents have different notion of quality and they prioritize different parameters. For example, the proximity versus school achievement or peer quality and you know, things like that. And schools maximize student achievement. Evidently, as we talk to teachers, student manageability, what I would call you know, that actually how obedient they are. Uh, they, they very carefully assess students from that point. You know, you know, the small kid coming at age six, and they actually watch closely how how the kid is behaving. You know, they give tasks, you know, and they say, "Oh, we're going to perform psychological." I've seen this. You know, they, 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 we, we will do psychological testing, and of course, it's just nonsense. Right? They don't do any real psychological testing. They just do it. They just watch the kid how the kid behaves. It's, it's really very interesting, and as I will say at the end, we, we, we're looking forward to do more ethnographic work on, on, on that sort of, you know, mutual reading of, of two matching sides. But also, what, what they maximize often is shadow revenue. Because they, they ask parents to give money for um, school materials, for classroom repair, for decoration of classroom, for this and for that. It, that can be up to, uh, it's not much. It can be about, you know, 1,000 euros a year. But still, it's money. It's not just, you know, so it's additional cost. I mean, in some schools, the thing is that the schools vary very much on how they prioritize it. So we had found a school which is, Standard curriculum school, no, nothing special about it. But the SES of parents was probably one of the highest in the whole city. So we just went there to look what's going on. And we saw what's going on. The, the school principal owns a travel agency. The school principal 
owns, owns uh, some, some other companies, small firms, which offer children, you know, summer in, in, in Britain, educational trips to, to Europe, additional sports activities, but all for money, but not through the school. Right? So those who want to be gymnasiums and, and teach Latin, they try to attract more students and get state funded. And this school didn't want to get state, fund, state funding. They were charging parents for additional services. So, I mean, it, you know, uh, in the 90s, there were more of it, sort of blunt you know, revenue making out of, of parents. Now it's a rarity. You know, it's 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 sort of the really very clear case of this one school, but but still, um, um, it's only few selective schools that I know that they just don't charge parents because they pride themselves on being selective, being very good at math, very good in in, in various you know other subjects, and uh, uh, so in some of these schools. You know, when when children go, you know, I, I remember going, you know, it's like summer trip to Germany. Uh, teachers decide which children should be subsidized by the school because not all the families can afford to pay. So about half of the school children, you know, are subsidized by the school, and schools are working hard and raising money from 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 outside of of, of, of parents. You know, like that are not charging parents, but they talk to businesses, they, they have private foundation attached to the school. But there's just about five you know, schools in the whole city of, of 600 schools, which are trying to be, you know, to watch, you know, the, the you know, sort of equity, social equity and, and that sort of thing. And, and um, we, we interviewed, you know, one of the things which, I mean, it's not that we have um, quantitative data, but we interviewed parents, asking them, you know, it's about you know, several dozen parents, uh, what would be your preferable ethnic composition of the school? And virtually no minority parents wanted to have a majority of their ethnicity in, in the school, because they were basically saying, we came to Russia, you know, uh, to integrate children, we want them to, to learn Russian. We don't want to have, you know, I mean, it's about 20, 30 percent of Azerbaijani kids in the school is okay, but no more. And of course, I mean, and then um, uh, uh, with, 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 with the majority, I would say that many people have zero tolerance, right? Would be the curve would be like this, right? And that's, that would, that's what we have from you know, interviewing more or less tolerant parents. But they say, 10%, fine. No more, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, so what we, um, um, and again, you know, the, the, the signals, as I already should have you know, switched the, the slides. Um, so the, the standard signal of purposeful communication, right? The, which is a signal, you know, the status. You know, they want to be gymnasium to attract students and claim that they have, you know, high quality education. They don't. In fact, you know, by my measures of, you know, unified test, tax exam scores and other measures, you know, half of the gymnasiums are cheating parents. They're not doing well. They are, if, if you do, if you regress unified state exam, on the SES of, of parents, half of the gymnasiums would be under the regression line, indeed. And you can see that the higher schools are, there is association uh, uh, between you know, the residuals and, and this regression in the selectivity. The more school is selective, the better it performs. So it takes students from poor social and economic background and educate them. And also, of course, they select by math ability. So that's that's no wonder that they perform well, and you know, many schools perform poorly. Then, interesting uh, signal which comes out of the probably the um, walking uh, 90s with a lot of criminal activities in the street that security in the school. 
among the schools and school security guards, just to signal parents that they are serious about managing the school. Uh, I don't think that actually it adds anything and don't, doesn't add much to security, but still it's, it's, it's again exactly the, the signal. Not, not very expensive. And additional cost announced, that's important. So they upfront often announce additional cost, which would be incurred by, by parents for uh, going through the education. You have to buy additional textbooks, and they are expensive. And we get it from interviews with parents that we went to the school, and they told us right away that they would have to buy additional textbooks. And we think it means they're going to charge a lot later. So we don't go there. So, and I think that's, that's a signal which is used both for poor and rich parents. For rich parents, it shows that they care about education, you know. And for poor kids, it's a repellent. You know, don't go to us. We don't want you. They can say it, but they, they talk about additional costs. And the same is in rural teching. So people come, we want to go to this class. No, no, no. The educational materials in this class will be very, very expensive. But you're welcome. Please come. But very expensive. And they just, you know, so it's all from interviews. And then they, um, in the, you know, of, through the interview with parents, we get something like what, what you have as the index of perceived foreignness of schools. You know, uh, um, uh, how parents scan the school quickly for cultural background, because it's hard to, to read how many books there are in, at home for these kids, right? So they go in and see, ah, oh, minority. No, 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 not school for me. And they're very, I mean, since these people are educated, I mean, the choosers are educated, and, uh, and they know that they should be tolerant. So it's very hard to elicit this information in an interview. You, you talk to them and say, everything is just fine. And only when you have trust into, with the interviewee, you know, you get, you know they say, well, actually, honestly, what, we, what I did, I went to five schools, and two of them had too many minority children from the test. I left immediately without even talking to teachers. But that's not the, it's not what I'm calling it, sign following, you know, Gambetta, because it's not part of purposeful communication. The additional quotes announced you know, up front, that's, that's, that's a signal, right? And this is, this is not. In, um, um, uh, it, for some parents, security is important, and for some parents are not, as we know. And, and we want to do, you know, as we'll say, you know, later. Uh, the another, yeah, the, 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 the signs, um, and it looks like um, teachers distinguish well the signs of social class, which is the material wealth, in a way, in education. And they want to have a balance in their classroom. They want to have, you know, kids from, you know. In, in some, some cases, they only look for educational resources and, and, and status in terms of higher education. They want to, because they think that um, kids from educated families, professional educated families, will be uh, more obedient, will, will study harder, and will ha have help from parents. And some schools are looking for, for social class and money. And those schools which are trying you know, to have the shadow revenue. And um, you know, it's not clear, I mean, um, and moving you know, to, to the further steps, it's not clear to me. I mean, I know how to, to survey parents. We will do, uh, I, I, I was planning it for for about two years, and I hope next year we'll do this, the factorial survey of parents that will present them with vignettes describing schools and, um, and ask them to, to, to prioritize you know, which schools they prefer. Then we're going to do um, um, ethnography of signaling, you know, and um, school interviews and then um, open doors events, so to speak, you know. 
uh, when when people come, what what they say, how they how they behave, and but I actually don't know how to survey schools because uh, teachers are very very reluctant to talk about their tricks of repelling um, uh, low income children uh, uh, because. But it's like with, with Gambetta, it's easier to interview taxi drivers rather than criminals who are trying to assault taxi drivers. And so, but we'll, we'll try to figure out something. We, we did interviews with, with, um, with primary school teachers, you know, about the tracking and the differentiation in the... Uh, they, they they say certain things. Um, yeah, they about their preferences, and it's uh, but but that's not much, and it's not clear to me how we can do a, a decent quantitative survey out of it, because if we ask more standard questions, we'll get just you know standard answers, which wouldn't be interesting and wouldn't differentiate you know, behavior of different schools and and. Uh, it's not clear to me how to ask more subtle questions, which would give us, you know, solid quantitative data. And, and then we want to um, uh, do uh, not only the regression and, you know, decision trees modeling, but uh, we want finally, that's a dream I have, to build, you know, sort of two agent models, schools and parents, making, having different preferences, different utility functions for, for different parameters and see whether we can come up with, with decent results. Um, so that's, that's it. <laughs>